good evening and uh, I'm here again to discuss a literary topic. Actually, I want to talk about Charles Dickens and his great expectations, that 1860 novel and his penultimate novel. Uh, but before that, I, uh, we, I would rather like to tra uh, trace a brief history or uh, just take a look at what novel or the trajectory of novel from in the English in the history of English literature and see how it has reached a point in the Victorian age when it can be called the great age of the English novel. Like novel or fiction is a term which we use for a narrative which has plot, which has character, which has a storyline and in Walter Allen's words uh, definite fidelity to reality that is it should be realistic so like in literature nothing happens overnight we know that they are tentative beginnings they are uh, attempts there are new experimental uh, ways of writing even one writer can try uh, his or her hand at different forms of literature because uh, uh, trying to find a foothold or trying to find their own uh, particular strength in uh, expressing in creative expression. Walter Allen once again says in his book, uh, in his critical book, uh, in the beginnings of the novel, that chapter, he says that uh, novel is definitely the last arrival in the realm of literature. Then why do critics or why do we have a certain um, compulsion to uh, give it a respectable antiquity. That, those are his words. That means that we try to prove to ourselves and to prove by tracing the development of literature, of English literature, that novel has uh, occurred before the mid 18th century, which we generally consider as the beginnings of the novel or uh, rather uh, the timeline where all the necessary components of fiction come together to create the classics and the masterpieces of the first generation of Richardson, Smollett, Fielding and Stern. So uh, if you consider novel just to be a work of fiction uh, and uh, a work which, or something which tells you a story without really adhering to realism as being one of the necessary prerequisites, then uh, maybe Morte de Arthur, which is that famous romance of the 15th century written in Middle English by Mallory, which combines the religious element of the Anglo-Saxon Anglo period and the romance which came in with the Norman conquest and fuses them together in the legions of King Arthur and his round table, the knights of the round table, and um, the chivalrous and the romantic aspect with the religious element in the search of the, uh, with the story of the knights going on in the search of the Holy Grail, which contains Jesus Christ's blood and those ideals of devout Christianity and the knights being devoted uh, warriors for the cause of Christianity, the uh, factor which the crusades or the religious wars were also uh, the campaigns which were going on in the medieval ages and that, fe uh, that notion of heroism, that knightly uh, mm, grandeur, that devotion, that dedication, that uh, holy cause or a holy mission which the knights always set out on. So it is a work of fiction of course but then it does not, it is pure imagination and imagination of, is of course one of the necessary conditions of any writer or a poet or dramatist's work. But this imagination, imagination is focused on reality and life is transfused through that imagination to create a literary work or a masterpiece. So if we consider or we are hell-bent on giving a history or a definite background to 
the origin of the novel, then maybe we can take a look at Moti the author and say that it is a work of fiction, definitely, but certainly it is not a novel. Then uh, you have other works of fiction in uh, the Elizabethan age uh, with uh, Sir Philip Sidney's uh, Arcadia uh, and uh, John Lyley's Euphues, where both these works, Euphues uh, particularly, it tells you a sketchy story, but the focus of Euphues is on uh, other ideas on other uh, philosophical uh, ideas which are projected through that work. And then Arcadia, it is uh, purely a pastoral work. So though Euphies and Arcadia are works in prose in the Elizabethan age, we would be stretching our imagination to consider them as novels. because. Again, as Walter Allen says, that novel should have a certain fidelity to facts and it should be a representation of life. It should tell you about life. So, leaving these works aside or just mentioning them and considering or stretching our uh, thoughts about the origin of the novel or works of prose, certainly we can mention them, but definitely they are not novel by any stretch of imagination. We know that the Elizabethan age was the great age of drama and poetry. It led to the 17th, 16th century, 17th century, and uh, up till 1625 is the great age of Shakespeare, which starts waning in the late Shakespearean age, giving way to other forms of drama and poetry the Jacobian drama, the Jacobian tragedy, the comedy of humors by Ben Johnson, the metaphysical poetry, and the Cavalier lyrics in place of the Elizabethan sonnets with their own beauty and with their own magic and with, of course, their great um, elevation or elevated forms of literature, particularly the metaphysical poets who were completely original and they brought in a completely diverse element in English poetry. Then of course this age it tweaks or it creates that great Puritan age and the great Puritan poet Milton <laughs> After 1660 the Restoration age or we consider it the neoclassical age, the coming of Charles the second to the throne of England, the restoration of monarchy, the opening of the theatres which had been shut down during the Commonwealth period, and the beginning of a period of literature which can be said to last from 1660 right to 1798, that is the beginning of the Romantic Age. The different terms which apply to this period are of course the first six years of the 17th century, the restoration period, the age of restoration drama, which we can say ends at around 1710, from 1660 to 1710. And then, of course, other words like neoclassical age, the age of prose and reason, the age of Dryden, the age of Poe, and the age of Dr. Johnson. It encompasses all these different periods, which is a long period of more than 150 years and we can compartmentalize it in different periods because there is such a lot of literature which has been created during this period in poetry, in drama, and of course in prose writing. It is also known as the great age of satire because of the satirical energies or the satirical influence which came in and the rationality and a skepticism which irony all these which are the tools of satire used to great effect by poets like Pope and Dryden. Dryden uh, turned to drama and he created his heroic tragedies which go side by side with restoration comedies which we know are in a class of their own. 
politically after the death of Charles II. The Charles II's uh, reign was a time of great licentiousness, which was reflected in literature of that time. In fact, the Restoration Comedy, which perfectly um, represents uh, the spirit of the time, it gradually became so obscene and vulgar, and the plots became so scandalous that it had to be banned from the stage. But uh, again, Walter Allen says that the uh, prerequisites or the requirements to make a, a novel very interesting and a very engrossing piece of work are present in Congreve, who is of course a dramatist, the greatest dramatist of the Restoration Comedies. But you know, the twist and the turns and the plotting and the interest in the characters, the urbanization, the um, down to earth quality, the uh, <coughs> complete uh, 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 lack of any kind of uh, over emotionalism or uh, uh, um, too much sentiment or it was a comedy which took you among people who uh, uh, cheated, who told lies, who plotted, who tried to outdo each other and all through in a very breakneck speed with a mercurial quality to the conversation. The prose had of course become brilliant and with its spelling, with its uh, double meaning dialogues with its witticisms, uh, which is makes the prose one of the greatest highlight of these comedies, or the comedy of manners, because they presented the society. That is another call reason why Walter Allen feels that Congreve would have been a very good novelist. He has all the qualities of a novelist, because you see people in the surroundings, people interacting with each other, whatever they are doing, they are cheating, they are telling lies, they are trying to outsmart each other, they are hatching plots and they are uh, generally creating a ruckus, we can say, because the atmosphere in these restoration comedies, the best ones, it, in spite of the vulgarity and in spite of the double meaning dialogues, um, it is a very electrifying kind of atmosphere and it keeps your interest alive. And that is what a novel is supposed to do. It is supposed to keep your, the readers engaged right from the beginning till the end and that interest sh uh, should uh, continuously be there and that is why the plot is very important as well as the characters who on their own strength come alive from the pages of the books and uh, they um, uh, uh, become real to the readers. Now. Um, Apart from the Restoration Comedy and the Heroic Tragedy and the satires of Dryden, there uh, appears to be another great piece of work which is again characterized as a work or, or fiction or, a, or something like a novel, in, not in the, again not in exactly corresponding to the characteristics of a novel, but it has that sense of reality, it has that sense of vibrancy, it has that true to life char characteristic, but of course it is an allegorical work and that is Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which is, uh, which, uh, is written or it, is, it comes out in uh, 1678 and it is a journey of every man who represents humanity at large and the whole moral allegory of temptation and finally reaching, avoiding sin and being pure in heart and soul and true to God, reaching the ultimate reward that is the gates of heaven. But we start the stud or we rather think that pilgrims progress or it could categorized as a work of fiction, not a pure novel, because it has many elements like reality, like a, a sense of the characters being real, real people, though they are not, they are just projections of ideas, of moral ideas, and having a beginning and a middle and an end. Now, uh, it is a very important work at the close of the 17th century, 
and then when we come to the 18th century before that great age or that great period that great year uh, 1740 we have some other great classics or masterpieces which are very important in their own way and which are great works of literature again not maybe not strictly novels because they don't have or they don't again meet all the qualities of the novel but they have a force they have a vibrancy they have a believable quality about them which makes them great no doubt whether we consider them pure novel or not of course these uh, two books are Defoe's, Daniel Defoe's Maul Flanders and uh, Robinson Crusoe. Um, Robinson Crusoe is, uh, it came out in 1719, so we're already in the 18th century. And then uh, the other uh, work by him, Maul Flanders, it came out in 1722. Now, Defoe was a man who had a very uh, busy life. Again, this will come, make, come to another point, which I will mention, and that is how these early writers or these novelists, they, ha they were writers, but they had other professions also, because being a full-time writer was not a conception which had occurred till them. Writing was not a profession. And not only that, these writers like Defoe and other Richardson and Fielding, they wrote their work when they are already middle aged. Uh, Defoe himself was around 51. Uh, Richardson was also not very young. He was also middle aged. And uh, these writers, they write their work and they create their masterpieces in rather late middle age, we can say. So, uh, apart from Maul Flanders, and you know, uh, uh, Richard, uh, Robinson Crusoe is about a man marooned on an island, and he shows such heroic qualities and such extraordinary qualities that many critics have said that he is like an universal representation of mankind. Of course, this situation is not true to life. It is not lifelike. It is not real in the strictest sense of the term, but these books are uh, landmark books and they show very much that the age of the novel or the beginnings of the age of the novel or the novel proper is just a matter of time as it happens and much to the great fortune of English literature and the history of English literature. Apart from Maul Flanders, and you know, Maul Flanders is also a very interesting book. It, uh, many critics say that it is about the mind of a criminal because it is written in first person. Again, at first, it is written by a woman and it, she writes it to confess her sins. She has had a very adventurous life. She has had a life which has been very, very uh, full of misadventures, you can say. It has been a very colorful life, and now she writes her everything about her life and a series of confessions. And the fact that the book is called Mall Flanders, you know, M O L double L. The mall is a word which is used to describe the arm county of a criminal, uh, and uh, she is uh, someone who, like in the movies by Ajit, is always called Mona, and she is supposed there to add to the allure of the scene. Of course, she is up to no good, but maybe I'd like to think that the word mall is directly derived from mall Flanders. And of course, you have Jonathan Swift also, who's Gulliver's Travels, which was published in 1726, apart from his other satires, Battle of Books, The Tale of a Tub, and these are among the generation of the writers who make up the first half of the 18th century before the first great generation of the English novelists come on the scene. And uh, they are both Swift and 
pope die within a few years of each other and then we can consider that the first two periods of the neoclassical age the age of prose and reason the age of dryden and pope it's it's more or less over by 1740 and from 1740 to 1780 is the age of dr johnson it is also the period which uh, uh, defines the beginning of the romantic or the purposes of the romantic revival because one very significant work occurs during this time and that is gray's elegy in a country churchyard which was in 1751 which shows the pensive and the thoughtful and the emotional way of looking at life which was missing in the age of the satire because they had a, a sort of a cynical and a very skeptical attitude towards everything this shows the beginnings of the change dr johnson of course that great um, essayist that great uh, intellectual that man of letters that great prose writer along with other pamphleteers and prose writers and jo dr johnson single handedly uh, uh, wrote the dictionary which increased the voc vocabulary enormously and all these qualities make it uh, possible for the novel to finally make an appearance in with all the requirements which are considered necessary for a novel uh fidelity to facts to quote what allen once again a uh, realistic setting a uh, believable characters a plot a perfect combination of sentiment as well as incident and a story a narrative all these qualities come together in the first great four the fab four we can call them richardson fielding smollett and stern and they were born within a few years of each other their works came out within a few years of each other like uh, pamela was the first book to be published all of another thing which we must consider here the different forms of the novel which came into existence and one of the foremost ones was the epistolary form because richardson's all his three novels are written in the form of a novel which we are uh, which we call the epistolary novel and if it is considered unrealistic then we can say that other types of novels which are written like uh, in the first person or uh, also uh, with someone having a universal vantage point or maybe uh, like in nelly dean in wuthering heights they are also an unrealistic way of telling a story but these uh con considerations apart we can of course or we do consider uh, richardson's works pamela and uh, uh, clarissa and the adventures of grandison his best his great works and of course there are the milestone or they are the landmark or they are historically that great moment when the novel comes into existence and uh, fielding's spoof because he had a great sense of humor comes in 1742 immediately after pamela which he calls shamala we started as writing a um, parody of pamela but his genius ran away with him and this book develops in a totally different manner where the um, um, adams and uh, joseph andrews they go through a series of experiences which makes the novel very very interesting and it creates a uh, the point of view shifts we can say from just being a spoof and uh, tom jones is of course the great picaresque novel and where we find a hero who is lovable but at the same time who is quite a adventurer and certainly not an ideal person but still um i suppose those were the reflections of the moral attitudes of this time and then of course you have smollett and stern whose works come out in 1748 79 1749 so their work is encompassed within these two uh, these decades the works their great novels like peregrine pickle and roderick random and tristram shandy these are great works which give a definite direction to the novel after these 
four uh, their careers and after the, the encompassed within a 40 40 years from 1740 for the uh, period of around 40 years uh, less than 40 years the form of the novel has been established and it grows in or develops in so many different directions that it is amazing to see the possibilities of the novel which have been brought out in the open or which have been which have got a start or which have been released we can say and uh, here during this period we have other great writers like Oliver Goldsmith who was a great dramatist his she stoops to conquer is a farce which is in a class of its own and his satirical poem elegy on the death of a mad dog tells a very biting lesson or it has a truth which cannot be denied then uh, the beginning of the gothic novel proper with Horace Walpole's The Castle of Petranto and which came out in uh, 1764 and then you have Mrs. Anne Radcliffe her book which came out The Mysteries of Udolpho which was published in 1798 these two gothic these two writers of the genre of the gothic novels brought it to uh, perfection and brought it to a point where the gothic novels create a class of literature which is different and which just shows again once, once more exhibits the forms which the novel can take the gothic the element of um, uh, gothic uh, feeling came in uh, with uh, there were many reasons for it one of them was you know the um, uh, great classic of the uh, ancient uh, literature which is known as the arabian nights it was translated in english and with its exotic uh, stories with its world full of imagination and romance and in, a, a, exciting adventures and fantastic settings that of that sort of also fueled the imagination and gothic became a trend not only in literature but also in uh, architecture and also in a kind of dressing where these uh, men and women they tried to spend their time in miniature uh, pseudo gothic uh, buildings which they erected on their grounds and they had this uh, very uh, very uh, you can say uh, trend the was of a taste for anything which was gothic and of course definitely the translation of arabian nights was one of the reasons that they discovered a magical world which was so different and the stories of suspense and supernaturalism and uh, mystery and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, exciting ideas like secret passageways like um, uh, changelings and uh, all uh, sudden uh, hauntings and things like that it was a, you can say it's a very imaginary and uh, sort of a very exotic and very um, romantic kind of taste in literature and in architecture and the gothic style the medieval style uh, the tales of medieval romances the superstition and unexplained mysteries all these caught the imagine imagination of the people another uh, woman writer and uh, of course the fact that there were women writers for the first time is also something very very significant another woman writer who makes a mark during this period the close of the from uh, the mid 17th uh, mid uh, 18th century to the close of the 18th century uh, is mrs fanny burney who wrote her epistolary novel called Evelina which came out in 1778 and so we see that a lot of literary work or a lot of work in novel writing is compressed in the 
last decades of the 18th century and the beginnings were already felt in the last decade of the 17th century with Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and of course uh, the early 18th century, Defoe's work which do carry you to a world which is very interesting but not very true to life, quite fantastic setting and situation and the characters also and Swift whose works are thinly disguised satires in once more totally improbable situations and characters. So uh, 1798 we know is the beginning of the Romantic Age and definitely poetry of the Romantics becomes the highlight of the turn of the century continuing up to the third or the fourth decade of the 19th century. The novel has been established, it is growing from strength to strength and as the Romantic Age once more captivates the taste and the consciousness of the people, we find two great writers who are born in the last decades of the 18th century, they are Sir Walter Scott and Jane Austen. So Walter Scott was born in 1771 and Jane Austen was born in 1775. Both of them start writing or their novels come out by the beginning of the 19th century, the second and the third decades and uh, they become the leaders of fiction in the early 19th century leading the way to of course the great age of the English novel where we will begin our study after we have just taken another or uh, a, uh, a little more detailed look at these writings. I will start with or I will focus on Charles Dickens's Great Expectations and uh, try to analyze it but before that like we said I like I said we have come to the close of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. The uh, Walter Scott and Jane Austen both are born now and their works, their great masterpieces will soon come out in the public arena and they will or their work will demonstrate the immense scope and the immense possibility of the form of the novel. Before we go further, I would, or it is interesting to see something uh, which is not really very well known because it is not a part of their books or it's not a part of their, how they write or what their art as a novelist is. But I think it's in a very interesting point. In a modern times, writing is a profession. You have professional writers, all the modern writers, Amitav Ghosh or Vikram Seth. Um, uh, they or Anita Desai in fact they are what you would call writers their profession is writing but when these and even in Elizabethan age Shakespeare was a dramatist and nothing else the university wits were also dramatists and poets they were writers they did not have any other profession apart from that but when the mid 18th century or in the late 17th century when these novelists or these writers come on the scene, like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Prog uh, Progress, he was not a writer by profession. It was not a conception that one has to be a writer to write books. He was a tinker and he wrote uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim or he wrote his Pilgrim's Progress because he had that inner genius or that gift or that compulsion to write. Similarly, Defoe was a man who was larger than life, he had a great uh, public life and uh, he was already 51 when his first book came out. So before that he was leading a very very busy life engaged in so many different professions and activity but certainly not that of a writer. He was a merchant, he was a trader, he was a journalist and 
also a spy so that is also something which is quite uh, extraordinary that he was a spy and with his busy life and with his various engagements still he wrote these two very um, powerful books which are considered as uh, giving a definite direction to the english novel and who which come at a particular period when no other writer has attempted something like that now uh, richard and then swift himself was a clergyman and he was an essayist also when uh, we come to the other contemporaries by or the first great four or the fab four richardson feeling smollett and stern we come to know that uh, smollett was a surgeon stern was a lawrence stern was a cleric so and then of course uh, we all know that richardson uh, around 50 when he wrote his or when his pamela came out he was a very prosperous businessman and a printer with a very sound business sense fielding was a man who was again someone who had who was uh, who had a personality which was very vibrant and who was leading a very active professional life he was a barrister he was an editor and he was also a dramatist women did not have any professions because in those days all these ladies mrs fanny burney mrs and radcliffe and of course jane austen they would be women who would already doing something which was quite a revolutionary step for their time they were writers but certainly they were not career women that was unheard of or unthinkable or unimaginable in that age and in that time when we uh, look at the uh, great walt sir walter scott that uh, flamboyant personality uh, who had such a illustrious career as a novelist taking for his raw material the uh centuries of his scottish history creating a huge canvas presenting larger than life figures an entire world of chivalry and romance and adventure for his readers in a series of novels which are known as the waverley novels apart from his other uh, works so walter scott was a sheriff he was a partner in a printing firm he was uh, an apprentice to a solicitor he was a clerk in a uh, court of sessions so he had a legal training also and um, he had a very busy life later on because his business interests did not really prove to be very successful he became almost bankrupt but then his uh, writing and his books paid for or they try he tried to cover the expenses or his financial ruin through the money which came in from his writing oliver goldsmith uh, the enduring dramatist and poet his he was a doctor's helper and he was a school usher and he had uh, he trained as a doctor and he practiced as a doctor also uh, tobias smollett was a surgeon he was actually a trained surgeon and then uh, we uh, see horace walpole horace walpole was the famous politician and he was a famous public figure so all these generations of these writers covering from the late uh, 17th century to the entire 18th century till we come to the 19th century are men and women not women women don't have a career as such except from writing these men are all men with an active career apart from their writing which was not the intention because there is no conception of having a profession as a writer but it came to them because it was their inner genius or the fact that they were gifted and they had to leave this uh, everlasting legacy in the realm of literature so these uh, cover up or uh, we sort of think that they are the writers who uh, are uh, 
particularly the writers who come after the fir first four, the, the Fab Four, uh, Walter Scott and Jane Austen in particular, they are born in the last decades of the 18th century, but they build or their fame or they their works come out or they do, are known or they gain recognition as novelists in the first two decades of the 19th century. So these are considered the early Victorians because Victorian age is such a large age, a huge uh, number of years. Queen Victoria came to the throne in 1837 and she died in 1901. And of course it was a period because it was such a long period, it covered such a lot of phases and such a lot of changes and such a lot of developments in every sphere of life, not only life, uh, everyday life, but also in politics, society, literature and religion. Because the political and the social and the cultural background of any age always affects or it is inter uh, influenced or finds expression in the literature of that age. So Walter Scott and Jane Austen, great contemporaries. Apart from these two famous names, there's another name called a woman writer again. She is Maria Edgeworth and her work came out in 1800 and she writes about the Irish landscape. She has also created what is known as the regional novels and these uh, regional novels is a term which is applied to Walter Scott's work also because they define or they take up as their uh, subject matter or they paint pictures from the life of a particular region, the life and the mores and social mores and the uh, values and the beliefs and the uh, influences or the impressions of that particular region like what is Scott of the Scottish area and Maria Edgeworth, she writes about Ireland. She, so she, and of course uh, Jane Austen is universal because she can take a small village like Highbury, Highbury and she can make it into any world, any, any place, anywhere, at any time because of the permanence of life which she infuses in them and again to stretch my comparison a bit far uh, we can say that uh, rather like Arkin Arayan and his Malgudi days where he takes a small nondescript town and makes it a representative of any town or any kind of people you find anywhere and similarly Jane Austen just takes a small place which can be any place she just gives it a local habitation and a name because as Walter Allen says that a novel has to tell you about a set of people in a definite time, in a definite place. So the village of Highbury becomes a place where you find people with whom you can relate to in spite of the passage of time and country and um, society and culture because their lifelike qualities are so convincing and that truth about human nature is so universal and it is so undeniable that we not only believe in these people but we can also understand and we can also relate to them. So uh, Walter Scott's Waverly novels uh, came out from 1814 and up till 1830. Jane Austen was already she was uh, 36 and she wrote her novels anonymously and all her six novels are compressed within a period of around six years from 1811 to 1817. Mansfield Park was the last work which came out in 1815 and uh, uh, she uh, died in 1817. In her lifetime her books were published anonymously. Again I suppose one of those uh, conceptions about men and women or the different ways in which we look at them which is prevalent in that period but after her death and when finally her novels deserved the great acclaim which 
they were meant for we understand that she is a novelist who is unparalleled in a interestingly in their own lifetime these two great contemporaries walter scott and jane austen his popularity was much more than Wal- uh, jane austen's in fact her emma her book pride and prejudice was not very popular when it was written but later on as the taste grew and then uh, the greatness of the book sort of filtered in it made its impact we know that it is belongs to the or jane austen is among the greatest of english novelists so these are the first generation of the early victorians now the second generation which really brought the english novel to a particular elevated standards which makes it one of the greatest ages in the english novel these were dickens trollope uh then uh, thackeray and the brontes and then finally george eliot they were all born within a few years of each other they were all born in the sec- uh, first and the, i think second and the third decades of 18th century i'm sorry 19th century they were all born within a few years of each other in the 19th century in the first decades of the 19th century so their art or their work matured together creating one of the most fruitful periods in the history of english fiction now today um, without looking at all of them in detail we all know that they were writing about uh, the society of their own age they were what were known as social novel novelists they were uh, in fact jane austen with her novel of manners as they were known and novels of social life she had established this form and this uh, novel presenting a view of life as it is led by people in a def- uh, in a particular society and the victorian age society was their raw material we can say from which they created their work but it was especially true of charles dickens and charles dickens uh, was, as we know uh, achieved success very early and it was around 1833 or 1836 when he uh, gained fame and recognition as working as a journalist and when his sketches of booths came out as pickwick papers and not only that but uh, his other work because he was a prolific writer and uh, pickwick papers shows the great humor or humor uh, tri- uh, the yeah, his uh, humor which was a part of his art as a writer but it is difficult to really summarize it because at the time the pickwick papers were coming out in serials he was also writing oliver twist which is a dark and a savage book does not have any humor and as a uh, legend goes charles dickens's own childhood trauma when he was a boy as a boy 12 due to his father's death he had to work as a child labor in a blacking factory um, in a warehouse It was a trauma which he never uh, forgot even when he became rich and famous it sort of consumed him till his mood became darker and darker in the later ages but all uh, in the later part of his life when you look at his picture you see a man who looks much older than his age his face looks drawn and grief stricken and he looks very worn and there is simply a look of a uh, great pain in his eyes and a great worry in his face so we do not know uh, or maybe it was because he was a very sensitive child that he could not forget the fact that he uh, was very conscious of class he went to a good school he was uh belong to a family of parents who uh were middle class and when he had to leave his school and he had to work and he felt an sense of emotional abandonment which grew more and more traumatic as he his life went on and he could even not even bear to speak about it the second generation of the novelists which come a few later they are born in the third and the fourth decades of the 19th century and these are uh, butler meredith hardy they are, uh, they come 
uh, we can call them the second generation. The reason why we divide this entire Victorian age novelists into, uh, we compartmentalize them into the first generation and the second generation is that this entire century is so full of events and not only that but it has, uh, one generation is different from another. And uh, of course uh, the rule of Queen Victoria with the polit political stability and apart from other things uh, is something which conditions the mind and the uh, attitude of these writers. Like Dickens' own personal experience completely changed his outlook towards life and it shaped his art as a novel. He, he particularly blamed his mother and that is why you have monstrous female characters in his books because he sort of caricatures his mother in them. And like I said, I would like to concentrate on great expectations in my last, uh, next uh, lecture because the great, ex great expectations is his penultimate novel and some say it is best work. Um, not only that, but it has themes which are very sophisticated um, and of course the monstrous female character is presented in his own sister, a pip sister in the book and because of his uh, the intensity of his emotions, you always have the lonely, abandoned, um, uh, stricken and uh, a sad child at the center of his novels in you have them you have it in Oliver Twist, you have it in uh, David Copperfield, you have the picture of little Nell, you have uh, and the you have of course Pip in Great Expectations. These are children who are at the mercy of the society because the Victorian age society was a very harsh society and it was a very difficult society, all that which is presented in Dickens's work. But in these early ge first generation novel novelists, Trollope and Thackeray and, jo and uh, Charles Dickens, they were men who belonged to the Victorian age society. They were not fighting against it. They were not alienated from their surroundings. They lived within that society because uh, Charles Dickens writes a lot about London. He's very critical, but at the same time he loved London. So this feeling of alienation is not there. They ident identify themselves with the age and the society. This sense of alienation which comes in later, and particularly in the modern fiction, when you find that the transaction between the writer and his age is a very uh, difficult one, uh, particularly in the 20th, 20th century and the 21st century. Uh, the, vic early, uh, the Victorian age writers like Charles Dickens they accepted the society, but they tried to improve things. They did not uh, alienate themselves. They lived in that society and, and they wanted to change things. And he is single-handedly uh, responsible for many reforms which had uh, the need of the day because uh, of the hypocrisy and the double standards which was present in the Victorian age society. On the one hand, you had the material prosperity due to industrial revolution, due to the uh, victory and uh, the um, Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, due to the uh, victory in Napoleonic Wars in 1815, due to the uh, colonization and uh, due to the rise in material wealth. Then there were contradictions also, like uh, the spread of education, which was actually a compulsory education act, but most often the spread of education was a substitute for of uh, for uh, illiteracy, uh, uh, semi-literacy substituted illiteracy. The reading public the education was mass education, but it was not really education. Another thing which I want to, or uh, which was very uh, obvious about the Victorian age novel writers and their work was that the Victorian age, the uh, classics were the best sellers. There was no difference or there was no demarcation between uh, pure literature and popular literature. This difference comes in the late 19th century when the penny novel came in and uh, the growth of factories and uh, the uh, growth of the reading public, most of them did not have a very sophisticated taste and most of them wanted just a uh, respite from their everyday conditions. 
and this becomes even more prominent in the 20th century where uh, classical literature because of the intellectual element which creeps in it does not uh, captivate the public imagination which is more interested in these penny novels or pulp fiction or the best sellers so best sellers and pulp fiction they are to become terms or synonymous with each other but in the age and the time of charles dickens and thackeray their novels or their works sort of dictated the public taste and the public sentiments people waited to read them because they were they came out in serials and they were sort of completely captivated by the characters which were created in them there was no sense of uh, not identifying with them so that was another great uh, uh another great uh, reason why it is also the great age of the english novel because uh, there was this sense of affinity between the novel writer and his reading public now dickens as he grew richer and more popular he seemed to withdraw more and more into himself and some of his characters become almost monstrous and almost unbelievable because as uh, walter allen says that he never lost his childlike way of looking at things that is why i want to uh, focus on great expectations and see how particularly two characters in that book they are not completely simplified projections of ideas or they are not personalities which have only one aspect to them these two characters are complex and again to quote walter allen he thinks that when charles dickens creates characters who are you know uh, not very complex he is of course very uh, powerful and believable but when he tries to do this with characters which have other realities to them or they have something a greater depth to them uh, which is not only uh, super uh, on the face of it it is not only in the appearance he does not really succeed but i do not agree with it because i find two characters in charles dickens's great expectations who are very interesting and they are uh, is, uh, you know full of uh, psychological uh, reality or they are full of uh, psychological truth which cannot be denied and certainly they are characters who are very interesting because they are different from what we expect them to be that comes as a surprise when the he Charles Dickens reveals their characters and their personalities so i think um, we have more or less traced the novel from beginning from uh, motte di arte to if they call them a novel by stretching our imagination to euphues and to arcadia to then finally banyan's pilgrim's progress defoe's small flanders and robinson crusoe swift's satires coming to the great four looking at the epistolary novels at the gothic novels at the great masterpieces of walter scott and jane austen then coming to the first generation of the victorian writers the brontes the uh, you know great uh, charles dickens and of course thackeray and trollop and their works also which come within a few years of the birth and as well as the work uh, which uh, comes within a few years of each other because uh, and of course george eliot who writes uh, 
whose work appear a little later so just to uh, see a chronological date of the date of the publications we know that charles dickens he uh, gained fame and recognition in 1836 with his pickwick papers vanity fair by thackeray it came around in 1848 adam bead uh, by george eliot she writes more in tune with the second generation of the victorians and so her attitude as well as a way of looking at characters is different she does not create character in broad strokes but she has a more penetrating insight into them and uh, she presents in the society but she is more interested in the development of her the inner uh, reality of her characters trollope and his work also come out 1855 to 1867 Jane Eyre by Bronte near uh, by uh, Charlotte Bronte in 1847 Wuthering Heights is a novel which is also published posthumously in 1847 making the it one of the most uh, powerful and most uh, beautiful books of all time in fact it has such a poetic quality and it does not correspond with any of the factors which were prevalent in that age and that time because it seems to be set in a totally different world and in fact some critics have also compared it to a shakespearean play and without a place and a setting but out of airy imagination and some also say that it is like a great poem but Uh, whatever it is but uh, without trying to categorize the novels we find that the victorian the victorian novels or the victorian novels fa- fall into two di- distinct uh, groups the first one uh, the uh, writers like dickens and trollope and um, thackeray and the brontes and george eliot and the second group are uh, hardy and Samuel Butler and Meredith but in the next class leaving uh, this uh, uh, looking at all the other novelists i would like to like i said take up charles dickens's uh, great expectations his penultimate novel and look at two of, uh, uh, with a little bit of uh, look or uh, understanding of his art of characterization and other Uh, very, uh, definite qualities about Charles Dickens as a novelist. I would like to discuss, in particular, two characters from *Great Expectations*, which is a book which is full of symbolism and also themes which are very uh, spiritual themes, in a sense. and also to do with human aspirations and we will find how these two characters fit in the context of that novel which is considered among one of the best works by charles dickens thank you